Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I remember when uh, you asked me to uh, to give this uh, this commemorative talk. I was, you know, deeply honored, really, because um, Jonathan was uh, a mentor and um, a friend, and uh, extremely influential in the field, as you said. Uh, but of course, he was also an incredibly fun person, and you know, I uh, I can't I can't think of uh, many people who uh, I'd rather like honor with um, uh, stories about what he did uh, scientifically, and uh, but also stories about uh, his uh, um, his antics and his exploits. Because um, yeah, there are a few things that I'd like to share with you that um, hopefully uh, put a smile on your face. So um, so for those of you who've never met John, um, so uh, this is this is him, and. Um, and he's got uh, a very loud voice. So if you've been in the same room with him, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, that you've noticed. Um, like <clears throat> like Jonathan said, um, John passed away. I I remember I got the an email from a friend uh, telling me and know exactly where I was, and I probably will uh, remember this because it's one of those. It's one of those um, events that you remember where you were uh, when you first heard about it. All right, so um, now I met John uh, when I uh, did my first postdoc with him. So I was a PhD student in uh, Bangor in Wales and, uh, and I uh, started to work with him through my PhD supervisor, uh, Sam Brownstein. And we had spent quite a few uh, emails going back and forth and I will talk about that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, but uh, when I started at JPL, um, I, when I first arrived at JPL, you have to go through all sorts of uh, uh, rigmarole uh, because it's a government lab. And um, so uh, I didn't actually see John until uh, it was lunchtime and uh, my office mate uh, walked us down to the cafeteria. And so I'd never met John at that point in person. And so as we walked into the cafeteria, I heard this really, really loud voice and um, talking about, oh, and I met Darth Vader and I was telling him this, that and the other. Uh, and then uh, I'm, uh, I went to the Borg Queen and I was like, what is this nut house? And so it turned out, of course, that that was John. And, uh, and I said, what are you talking about, John, uh, after our first hellos? And John said, well, I know that I have a very loud voice. And uh, we, after, other than in the group talks, I only really see people um, during lunchtime. So when we want to talk office, I have to have a code. So all the uh, the management uh, types that he had to deal with, uh, he all gave names from villains from Star Trek, Star Wars, and Lord of the Rings. And so um, I, to this day, don't know uh, what their real names are, but I do remember them by their um, uh, by their code names. So that's, that was John uh, happily talking about uh, management uh, in the cafeteria at uh, full volume. So, um, so now I do want to talk about uh, John's work uh, in general, but of course I have to uh, really um, restrict it to the, the bits that I know best. Um, uh, but I do not want to miss out on some of the really influential early work that he's been uh, involved with. And, um, and worked on, and that's photonic band gap work. So he did that at Missile Command um, before he came to JPL. And I do not know enough about this uh, to really um, to really talk about this in depth. However, um, I do know that it is uh, it was very influential. And uh, well, I know that because I looked at the uh, the Google Scholar. Um, uh, citations, but also um, my colleague in Sheffield uh, who worked on photonic band gap uh, material um, is very well aware of John's work in this uh, in this area. But um, really uh, what I'm talking about today is uh, John's role in um, pushing the the second quantum revolution. And this is a term that was coined by John and Jared Milburn. So I'm not gonna attribute it solely to John because I don't really know who came up with that. Uh, neither can I attribute this quote solely to John uh, because this is taken from uh, the paper, the second quantum revolution from 2003. Uh, uh, and it says that by the end of this century, that is the 20th century, this first revolution of quantum mechanics has evolved 
into many of the core technologies un underpinning modern society. However, there is a second quantum revolution coming, which will be responsible for most of the key physical technological advances for the 21st century. And now this is a bold statement, and uh, John has been working tirelessly to, um, to push this along and to, to help make it happen. And I think it's actually true. Um, I, I think when um, quantum computing hits the mainstream uh, in terms of pop culture, then I think um, you, you know that, um, uh, uh, that it's making an impact. And uh, there is a BBC series from earlier uh, last year uh, uh, called Devs that, uh, that really is all about quantum computing. And um, it's a good show, uh, you should check it out. All right, but that's not why we're here. Um, so I want to talk about the first paper that I can tell was really John's uh, foray into um, the quantum technologies that, um, that, he, that he really came to sort of have in mind by the time he wrote his 2003 paper. And this is the paper of the atom laser gyroscope. And I think this was a transformative paper for John. Um, I know that he was very proud of it. Um, and I, um, also, um, I also think it's an absolutely beautiful paper. So um, the paper is from 1998. It's called Correlated Input Port Matter Wave Interferometer, Quantum Noise Limits to the Atom Laser Gyroscope. So John um, uh, did a couple of things here, but um, first of all, it was essentially an atom uh, laser gyroscope, meaning uh, he, co he coined the term atom laser. And so this is something that he tended to do. He, he likes to coin new words. Uh, in the in the field, and the the idea here is that uh, with the analogy of um, a Max Zander interferometer, um, uh, you can send in um, atoms into a an atom beam splitter, and so he uh, created uh, this um, this figure for the paper. And uh, there's a couple of things here that we uh, where we can immediately uh, recognize that it's John's work. Uh, he uses these little flourishes and. Uh, our old friend, the, the colon in the title. We'll, we will encounter that again. And um, I have my own strong views on these matters. And so um, this was a source of, of many debates. And, um, but it was always, uh, always uh, good natured. Um, but yeah, so this work is where John um, basically took ideas from optics, applied them to uh, atomic physics uh, in order to uh, create some new quantum technology, uh, namely, well, uh, I mean, the um, the gyroscope was, of course, already well known in the Sanyak, uh, the optical Sanyak was well known, but he analyzed uh, the atomic version of this. Um, and also for everybody who's watching who doesn't know this paper and who's in the early stages of their career, I'm thinking PhD students, um, early career postdocs, um, this paper is a fantastic example of how to write a clear scientific paper. And I just recommend it to everybody. It's something to emulate. And I, um, I think I was uh, definitely very influenced by it. Right. So the main physics of the atom laser gyroscope paper is that uh, John treated the atoms like bosons and then described them using the Schringer representation. And so uh, that is basically where you... Um, well, I'm, let's not go into that in too, too much detail because um, uh, it's very clearly uh, uh, written in John's paper and I don't really have the time, I think, to go into too much detail. But the idea is that um, when we have the, uh, I do not have a, a pointer, that's all right. Um, so if you look at the picture in the bottom corner, um, you see that um, uh, uh, we have uh, incoming modes A and B and outgoing modes C and D. And so what you want to do is measure the number of atoms that are coming into uh, detector U and detector L. And so um, uh, you have uh, uh, number operators, C dagger C and D dagger D. And so by measuring the number of photons, you effectively can construct the quantum mechanical observables N and M, which is essentially the sum of those and the difference of those. Now, the sum doesn't change. And what you can do is you can propagate those operators back through the interferometer. And so you can express N and M not in terms of the outgoing mode, but in terms of the ingoing mode. And because uh, N is just the total number of atoms, that doesn't change. So 
uh, the total number of atoms in C and D is the same as the total number of atoms in A and B. So we have N is also equal to A dagger A plus B dagger B. However, the difference uh, does change. And the difference changes in, a, in an interesting way. Um, the, and it depends on the phase phi that gets picked up in the interferometer. All right. Now, if you measure M, and uh, then you will get a variance um, just based on your measurement outcomes. And that's your delta M squared. And uh, we also have a perfectly good model of what is the expectation value of M uh, as a function of phi, because I have this operator M in terms of cosine phi and sine phi. So I can calculate the expectation value as a function of phi, and then I can take the derivative. And if I um, take the modulus square of that and um, take the ratio of the variance and that derivative squared, then I get the variance on the phase. And this is what John did. He calculated the variance, uh, which essentially yields the precision of the measurement. Right? And so we know this you know, very well um, if you uh, work with um, Max Zander interferometers, uh, but he applied this to, uh, to atoms. And so he considered uh, a, a great deal of different families of input states. So um, uh, the first one was uh, just sending n atoms into input beam A and nothing in input beam B. And he found that he gets the shock noise um, uh, in, in the uh, atom number, uh, which is given by 1 over the square root of n. And then he considered uh, another uh, state, uh, n plus over 2 and, and, and minus, over, uh, sorry, n plus 1 over 2 in mode A and minus 1 over 2 in mode B and then, you know, reversed. So this is actually an entangled state. And, um, and he found that you actually reach the Heisenberg limit, 2 over n plus 1. And, um, and John showed about six family, uh, considered six families of states and uh, worked out what, uh, how, the, how the phase noise scales with those atom numbers. So um, now this was a seminal paper. And um, uh, so I think, uh, uh, and th this little light bulb in the top corner I, is actually in John's paper. Um, it's uh, again, um, the, the, the detail that he, uh, he puts into his drawings is, uh, is, is very characteristic and I found it um, uh, a lovely little nod uh, that's, you know, I think uh, a light went on in uh, for him uh, because he started thinking about metrology and entanglement in a, in a really deep way um, and combined different physical systems in the service of technology. And that's something that he's been uh, doing, doing ever since, really. And, um, and he moved towards linear optics for implementing quantum information applications. And, and I think this is really where his biggest impact is. And also, it, very notable, he did not uh, talk about noon states in this paper. Um, uh, noon states will come in later. Uh, but before I want to talk about uh, noon states, uh, I want to say a little bit about entanglement. Because um, around the time uh, when um, I started working with John uh, on lithography, um, he also uh, published a paper on clock synchronization. So this was with Richard Josa and Dan Abrams. Dan was at JPL and Colin Williams, uh, who was also at JPL. In fact, Colin Williams, um, he was at JPL before uh, John Dowling and started um, a quantum computing um, group. And um, he um, convinced John to join him at JPL. So we have Colin to thank. Uh, I personally have Colin to thank you know, in the grand scheme of things. Now, the idea here is um, uh, not, not too dissimilar. Uh, well, it's a little bit different, but um, uh, very much related to the wonderful talk by Antia uh, yesterday, um, where you can use entanglement uh, to um, measure a phase and uh, using that to synchronize clocks between um, Alice and Bob. Now, um, this was um, uh, th so. This was a very interesting um, uh, uh, paper, and, and it caught my eye. And uh, subsequently, I did some work on on this. But um, uh, th there was uh, there was some problem with it. There was an uh, there was an uh, an issue with it, and um, that was picked up. Uh, and there was a lively debate. Um, uh, oh no, not yet. And um, 
I thought I had another slide. Um, uh, but uh, so it doesn't quite work. But what John did was um, uh, he put this uh, this paper on the archive, but not before he started uh, calling his um, uh, his, his contacts uh, in uh, the DOD and um, the uh, Department of Energy. Uh, John worked at Missile Command. He had a he had a good network, um, and uh, so he started telling people, "Oh, I've got uh, this clock synchronization protocol using quantum entanglement." And everybody was uh, he was speaking to was like, "Wow, that's." Um, uh, that's fantastic. And then, um, uh, so uh, you know, uh, how does it work? He said, "Well, uh, I'm um, I'm going to put it out on the archive uh, Monday morning, and uh, so you'll uh, uh, you'll get to read it then." And so he told this to maybe uh, somebody from uh, DARPA of, or, or the DoD. I cannot remember really. Uh, but the uh, the point was that he started to get phone calls. And um, so he uh, told me, like, yes, uh, all these people from all the funding agencies, they all talk to each other. And, um, uh, and so uh, the, the word is doing the round that we have a, a high precision clock synchronization protocol and all the, the military types, they're super interested in, in what's, what's going on here. And so he gets to uh, through all the you know it's the um, NSA NRO uh, all the they all they all contact him and at some point um, he gets a phone call from uh, from somebody and um, and he doesn't know who's with and he the and the person is is quite cagey and he goes like yes I'm from a government agency and uh, and I would like to uh, I would like to fund your research uh, because I hear you're doing um, you're doing clock synchronization work. And uh, and so he didn't give a last name. I think his first name was Pete, and um, and that's all I heard about it. And uh, because I was a foreigner working at JPL, I was actually not privy to a lot of uh, this uh, information. So I certainly don't know his last name. And um, but yeah, so so they were talking and uh, a little bit about uh, yeah. So they were going to fund John and John's group uh, for like one million dollars. And uh, so great. So John was very happy um, because uh, you know uh, that's uh, that keeps the lights on. And uh, so the you know, the conversation comes to an end. And uh, and so Pete says, "So um, uh, when can I hear about the uh, the clock synchronization protocol?" And John says, "Well, uh, it's going to be archive uh, on Monday morning. So you'll learn about it then, along with everybody else." And uh, so so yeah, I don't know if I. Uh, would have been uh, that cheeky if somebody just handed me a million bucks, but there you go. That was John, and um, so the the clock, sy clock synchronization paper had quite a lot of impact. Um, well, a million dollars uh, in the short term. Um, uh, also, it inspired me to work on uh, remote clock synchronization, and then that turned into quantum repeaters. And uh, and also even um, with Ulvi Yurtsever at JPL, um, we were lo looking at uh, decoherence due to quantum fluctuations in the background metric. Now, that was a lot of fun uh, and less than practical, uh, but yet that got uh, a fair amount of uh, citations as well. So. Um, so yeah, but more broadly, I think this work uh, inspired uh, uh, a lot of interesting things, including the study of reference frames as a quantum resource. And there's a really nice um, review of modern physics paper. Uh, it's, it's a bit old by now, but uh, this, this, this field has evolved. Um, so there's a paper by Steve Bartlett and Terry Rudolph and Robert Speckens. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I recommend that uh, to everybody. So, um, so yeah, and so then um, noon states. Uh, I think uh, John is uh, very well known for his role in um, in, in noon states, um, and um, actually, they uh, in our work they were not the first. It's not the first place that they um, uh, they showed up. I think this is uh, work by uh, Barry Sanders and um, Olivier Fister. I think um, uh, springs to mind. Uh, so it's a bit older. Um, but it wasn't really on our radar until um, uh, quantum uh, lithography. So this is where I joined um, uh, John's uh, sphere of influence. And um, uh, because I was doing my um, PhD with Sam Brownstein and Sam met John and said, John's working on this really interesting thing and they can make lines, uh, but uh, the referee is asking for uh, something more interesting. And Sam said, Peter, I think you can uh, you can do something like that. 
And so I thought about it and I came up with something I'll tell you in a bit. But the, um, the idea here is that uh, by using entanglement in light, and in particular noon states, you can uh, write much, much um, uh, smaller resolution uh, features on a substrate. So this is a really about printing, so, uh, making microchips. All right, so um, uh, so this, these are two pictures from the paper, um, actually, because um, 20 years have passed since, um, there are better ways of introducing uh, uh, this stuff. Uh, but I do want to note this little um, little colon here um, that was there. I had nothing to do with it, and um, yeah. So uh, quantum lithography, uh, how does it work? Well, let's suppose that I have two beams, A and B, two, uh, two sinusoidal waves, and they are counter-propagating. Then we get interference uh, along the, um, uh, the surface of the substrate. And they're coming in at an angle phi, and let's call it the, the grazing angle. And then we also have some control over the phase of, um, of in input mode B. So if we use classical laser light, so a classical uh, wave, then um, the, uh, the fringes that you see, so the, uh, the size of your um, delta X here is really the difference between the dark and the light, uh, adjacent light uh, fringes, um, is going to be lambda by, uh, by four sine phi. And sine phi here would be, uh, well, you could think of that as a numerical aperture. But uh, that's using classical light. And so John's idea was, what if you use quantum light? So in particular, you use N photons, but rather than putting the uh, photons in a um, sort of uh, distribute them in some kind of uh, Poisson distribution, like you would imagine classically, um, you put them either all in mode A or all in mode B. And, um, and you do that in, a, in an equal superposition. Well, then uh, you are going to get fringes that are much more closely spaced. In fact, you're, um, you get a factor of one over n in there. Right? And, that's, uh, and that's the idea of quantum lithography. So uh, if you increase uh, the number of photons, if, uh, if I have one photon, I get uh, my, uh, if we do this, we repeat this many, many times uh, clearly, then I get this single fringe. For two photons, you get two and, and so on. You, see, you can see you can get really, really, um, uh, really small fringes. And so that was the paper, and they sent it out uh, for review with uh, PRL. And, uh, and then they had the, re um, the referee report back asking, you know, yeah, that's all cool, but what, you know, can you do something more interesting? And, and that's what uh, John was talking to Sam about. And Sam came to me, and so I started to work on... Uh, and I did uh, a, a couple of things. Don't want to go too deep into it. But one of the things that I did was... Um, uh, look at some generalization of these uh, states um, and then take the, su uh, the sum over uh, little m so I can make different superpositions of uh, different generalizations of these entangled states. And uh, when you do that, you end up with... Uh, so what I wanted to do here was um, um, uh, match a, a step function. So I have like a little trough with very sharp edges. And so you can see that uh, we get some features, of course, um, but um, uh, we get uh, we get indeed a very steep um, uh, drop around pi over two and uh, around uh, three pi over two. And so uh, and that did the trick. So we got published. Uh, Sam and I got on the paper, and um, and and yeah. And so the rest is history. Um, so then there were, of course, um, some early experiments. So uh, there was Jan Washi's group with uh, Milena D'Angelo and Maria Chekova. So that was the very first um, um, experiment. So we got we were very excited uh, when that came out. And then Bob Boyd and his group uh, with Ryan Benning and Sean Bentley uh, also did um, um, some coincidence imaging. Um, so essentially turning the, the, the thing around. And so uh, lithography and imaging have sort of like uh, been bedfellows ever since. And then because we were using noon states, people started to think, well, can we do noon states uh, in the lab? And so uh, there was uh, 
uh, Ephraim Steinberg's group with Jeff Lundin and Morgan Mitchell. Um, and, and yeah, so they uh, did a, a three photon noon state. But remember, we could only do two photon noon states at that time. And then um, Anton Seilinger's group with Philip Walter um, uh, did uh, the four photon uh, noon state. Yeah, and so they are not called noon states. The um, we start we had by then started calling them noon states. The journals were not so happy uh, using the term noon state, but uh, but there you go. Um, so um, the impact I, I think has been rather large. I mean, certainly if I look at my citation um, index, it is the top one after my review paper, and um, so uh, I think people like to cite this paper because it's a poster child for quantum technology that is not computing or key distribution. Um, and with computing, people often, or used to it in, in any case, uh, talk about uh, Shor's algorithm and uh, and also maybe Grover, but Shor was the big one because it gives you the exponential speed up. I think now people are um, sort of broadening their horizons a little bit more, or maybe uh, the, the notion that quantum computing is interesting has already sort of like settled itself into the, the general consciousness um, uh, you know, in society. So maybe we don't have to argue why it's so good anymore. But yeah, um, now it's of course it's it's extremely in, uh, difficult, to, uh, if not impossible, to implement in practice. Um, and but it also highlights the importance of noise management um, in metrology and in imaging, and um, and it gives also the the ideal case. We know, that, um, and so yeah, um, in in. Um, uh, modern speak, I think this is a stretch goal uh, to uh, uh, to have in mind when you propose uh, new research. So, um, so it's very aspirational. And then, of course, we get to the um, the point. Uh, okay, how can we create these noon states? So, and in fact, when I arrived at JPL, this was the the main question on John's mind: um, How can we create noon states? So, I had my own ideas uh, about this, and um, and they were not called noon states at the time. Um, so we wrote a number of papers uh, on this. Um, so the first one was, was with uh, Nicholas Surf, and then um, uh, so Nicholas was visiting. He had a visiting um, uh, sort of every year, uh, visited JPL, and then uh, uh, Wang uh, Li and uh, John and I we kept on working on this. So we uh, we got another paper uh, out of this, and uh, we called it Large Photon Number Path Entanglement. Um, and so that was the, the thing. And then we got the um, the quantum Rosetta Stone paper, which I will talk about a bit more in, in a minute, but um, and I need see, I need to speed up a bit. Um, this is the first time where noon states entered the literature in the Rosetta Stone paper. And um, John uh, wanted to make sure that it was N zero plus zero N. So, he thought, oh, if I just write O, they're thinking it's going to be the letter O. So he used the old matrix printer style um, zero with a little uh, line through it. And then, of course, the tech setters thought it was a phi. Um, so that backfired massively. Um, but yeah, so the story of, uh, of noon states. So basically, um, Wang and I, we were talking um, uh, a, a lot because we were uh, not quite in adjacent offices, but um, we were talking and, um, and yeah, it, it, gets, uh, it, it gets pretty um, uh, tiring to always talk about large photon number uh, and path entangled states. So we started to call them noon states. And um, and then uh, because this was in LA, I had moved in with um, uh, my then girlfriend, and uh, whom I met in at JPL, and um, and so around the her parents' place uh, on Pico and Robertson, there is a, a lighting shop called McNoon, and um, and in fact, um, it's uh, I thought that was great. Um, they've got a four point eight rating, so if you're in the neighborhood, check it out. Um, and so yeah, so that's um, so I called it uh, noon states, and um, uh, together with with Wang, and just out of laziness, and John picked it up and said that's fantastic, and so he um, uh, morphed it into high noon states, and he came up with uh, uh, this poster. He uh, pulled this poster, and 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 uh, his talks about noon states started with the with this poster. 
Okay, so then linear optical quantum computing uh, uh, came in. That was around the same time I moved to LA. And, um, and so it really did change everything in, uh, in quantum optics. There were several ways in which people were thinking, how can we do quantum information processing? But KLM really um, showed that it could be done. And then of course, the, the next stage was, okay, how can we do this practically? And so this is a, a picture of um, uh, the authors of the uh, review paper that we all wrote together and, um, and which was later to morph into my uh, book. Um, and uh, so we've got uh, Jared Milburn. Well, we're all in the, in the order of the authors, so you can, you can figure it out. Uh, that was not, not a coincidence. And this was actually at the conference that John organized in, um, I wanna say 2008 uh, in, in, uh, in Baton Rouge. Right, so the idea that John took away from KLM was that every action that can be performed on a quantum computer can in principle also be achieved with linear optics and photo detection. And as soon as you realize that, basically a whole world opens up and uh, and it's like what, pick the, the most uh, uh, cool things that you can think of and then look at uh, how do we uh, uh, do that uh, with linear optics and photo detection. And then, of course, because we also know what the limits of linear optics are, what is actually the effective uh, nonlinearity of photo detection? And those kinds of questions uh, is what uh, John was thinking about at that time. And then, of course, he realized, you know, there is a there is an analogy between the Max Zander interferometer uh, and when you use atoms in a Ramsey interferometer, which of course uh, goes back to his uh, atom laser uh, gyroscope paper, and then uh, the Hadamard logic gates in quantum computing. And, uh, and we had a fight about this, whether we should write this up as a paper. And because I thought like, you know, this is, this is obvious, it's exactly the same maths. And he said, no, no, this is not at all obvious to people who are not so familiar with the maths. And I was like, who's not familiar with the maths? And of course, turns out loads of people are not familiar with that maths because, you know, that I had a very myopic view as a as a young beginning postdoc. And John had the uh, the, the breadth of, uh, of view to realize that people actually want to know this kind of thing because it helps them conceptually. And so we did publish this uh, because he was my boss and he could overrule me and we wrote the paper and, uh, and it is also, again, one of our highest citing papers. And so he was totally right on that. So there's another, um, another lesson for the younger generation. Um, don't be too myopic. Uh, it, what may be completely obvious to you uh, may not be obvious to everybody. And if it's obvious to you, you can write a really, really uh, um, good and accessible paper about it. And, um, and look at John's papers because they are an excellent example. Right, and then of course, like I said, um, this this review paper became the basis of uh, a book that I wrote with Brandon Lovett, and um, and so because John was my mentor, I sent him a copy, and uh, and then he sent me an email a little bit later. Uh, so he um, uh, had all his contacts from all his. Um, uh, 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 you know, all the funding agencies. And he said, oh, my postdoc uh, 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 co-wrote a book uh, with, uh, with his, his um, longtime collaborator, collaborator, Brandon Lovett, and it's a fantastic textbook and um, you should all read it. So I recommend you uh, all go out and grab your own cock and love it. And uh, so that's, um, and that's the story. Right, so now I promised in the abstract that um, I would also actually give you some new science. Uh, so um, John uh, got quite interested in boson sampling and, um, uh, and in particular in uh, how to implement this. And so he had uh, done a, a bunch of um, work on this. And then my postdoc Xi Jin Wang um, met him at the a conference in, uh, pro probably in Sydney um, uh, where um, John was uh, then he was also he had some uh, contact with uh, Yan Wai Pan's group um, and they were talking about that and so uh, Xi Jin and John got to talk about this uh, then Xi Jin's then uh, PhD supervisor Dominic Berry got involved and uh, Peter Rohde and so um, uh, th this came all uh, together and they started talking about um, how can we use um, uh, boson sampling uh, for something interesting, right? For, um, so um, now the idea is that um, uh, modes, optical modes, are actually relatively cheap, 
right? But, um, well, if you don't control the modes, they are extremely cheap because they're all around us. Uh, but the photons, uh, they are relatively expensive. And But what I mean by modes are cheap and photons are expensive is the following. So here's a, a, a lovely picture that we've already, I've already seen uh, several times in this conference, um, uh, where uh, every line here is an optical mode, and you can just basically, uh, well, I say just basically, as a theorist, you should never say that about an experimental work, but you can uh, write these modes on a chip, and uh, they are really high quality, and uh, and 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 they are made essentially routinely. Right? So in that sense, um, uh, these are. Uh, uh, modes um, like this are cheap, and these are controlled modes. Uh, photon sources, on the other hand, they are uh, not cheap. And so here's a picture of, uh, well, actually uh, a very recent picture uh, where, where you uh, create waveguides um, and you uh, create your photons in your waveguide. And we've seen talks about that as well. Shout out to Lawrence Rosenfeld, first author here. Uh, he was my project student in Sheffield and doing his PhD in, uh, in Bristol. And um, yeah, so uh, this is actually much, much harder because you have to use parametric down conversion like inside uh, uh, a, a waveguide on a chip and then you have to filter and you know, this, that and the other. So, all right, so boson sampling of course is kind of nice for that because uh, you've got a lot of modes M and you've got a lot of photons N. And um, the idea behind boson sampling is that the um, output distribution is proportional to the permanence of an n by n submatrix of u. And, um, and if you don't fully understand what that means, that's okay. I'm not really going to use that. But, um, but the, the, uh, the, the problem of the permanent is that, or the feature, depending on your perspective, is that it's um, exponentially difficult to calculate um, exponentially in n. And, um, uh, so that's, that's, uh, that difficulty uh, lies at the heart of some, uh, uh, some of the speed up that you can get in boson sampling compared to classical descriptions. All right, so uh, we turned it into something called quantum data locking, right? So quantum data locking is actually something that uh, was introduced by David DiVincenzo. But the idea is that um, uh, we can encrypt a long message with a shorter secret key while still achieving information theoretic security. Information theoretic security means that um, you can bound the amount of information that you leak. So um, you have a little epsilon and um, uh, you can um, you can make epsilon uh, exponentially small, not zero, but exponentially small. So you choose how much you can uh, you 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 want to leak uh, to to the um, to the environment, including Eve, and um, and and then you can have a, a certain level of um, uh, of, of privacy. Um, so classically, to sh to achieve the security, the the key really has to be as long as the message, right? So this is the the, the idea behind the one-time path, and that's basically Shannon's theorem. All right, so uh, the, our paper, Photonic Quantum Data Locking, uh, was um, uh, recently accepted in Quantum, and the, um, uh, the archive number is, uh, yeah, is down here. Uh, so, and I'm going to tell you now a little bit about the, uh, uh, about, uh, the work in the remaining five minutes or so. Um, so uh, the idea is that we have uh, some kind of network uh, where Alice can implement uh, a U sub K. So basically there's a whole set of unitaries that we index by K. And then Bob can do the inverse. And if there's no Eve, then um, you can think of this as, a, as an encryption. And the UKs are, um, are known to everybody, including Eve, but which K is cho chosen is not. Uh, and that's, um, that's set up uh, uh, secretly by Alice and Bob. Um, so now uh, this is, is, is in a way a, a relatively straightforward idea uh, and uh, the, uh, the novelty and the importance of, the, of this particular work is, that, uh, is, is in the proof of the information theoretic security. Um, right, information theoretic security, I should also say, is the gold standard. So, um, so I think that's that's really what's important. But so I don't go through over the proof, uh, but what I uh, but I will go over the uh, over this um, uh, the protocol, and so you know that it is uh, secure. So we have a message, uh, and we use uh, log m bit. So m is the the size of the message, uh, the number of um, 
uh, yeah, num messages that fit in those number of bits. And then we have a key uh, that is uh, log k, and we want that to be much smaller than log m. Right. Um, so Alice and Bob publicly deca declare a set of unitary transformations UK uh, with K uh, ranging from one to K. So basically uh, we have, um, um, uh, so that matches the, uh, the key. Um, the UK do not commute with each other so that uh, we have incompatible uh, measurement bases, right? And that's where you get your protection from uh, against Eve. And then uh, Alice and Bob share the secret key of log k bits by standard uh, QKD. And that's how they determine UK. So you, by virtue of the you know, known standard QKD, we know that Alice and Bob have a, uh, a perfectly secure um, identification of which unitaries they are going to use. Um, so now they know what they're going to use. And because K was determined using the secret key, Eve doesn't know. That's the, that's the key thing. So Eve cannot make a measurement on the state without a li high likelihood of being detected because Alice and Bob do the same thing as what they do um, in um, um, uh, QKD. After a while, they, they sacrifice a little bit uh, uh, of the message to, um, uh, to make sure that... Um, uh, there was no uh, Eve on the line. So now the key result in our paper is applying this to circuits with M optical modes and N much smaller than M photons. And so the difficulty here, of course, is that, um, uh, you know, even, it's, even though it's fully solved for, uh, for qubits, um, when you go to optical modes, then you can have photons leaking into each other's modes and you have to uh, account for that. And... Uh, uh, so it's it's not quite uh, a straightforward um, uh, porting of the proof uh, from qubits to uh, to linear optics, and uh, yeah. So the hard part is showing that we can indeed achieve information theoretic security uh, when log k is much much smaller than log m, right? And then that culminates in uh, proposition one, uh, uh, and I'm not going to read the whole thing out. Uh, there are some. Um, um, uh, a few things that I haven't introduced at all, like gamma and epsilon and c min um, and d, for that matter. Um, so, uh, so this is what John Dowling would have called proof by intimidation, um, and uh, uh, not to be confused with uh, proof by obscure reference. And um, so, I'm going to go to the plots, and uh, because that's really. Um, uh, where the, the, the you know the interesting uh, results are. Uh, so what can we achieve? And if, then of course we include uh, losses as well. Uh, and um, not in this picture actually, but uh, so in this picture we chose our epsilon, our level of um, uh, information leakage, and you see that we take um, uh, exponentially small amount of leakage. Um, and so you see that uh, once we get more to more than ten photons. Uh, our, um, uh, uh, our log k, so that's the, the the dashed and dotted and dashed dotted, like green, red, and purple. Um, uh, those are uh, dropping below the um, uh, the length of the message. And in fact, uh, the uh, in the asymptotic uh, um, regime where n is very very large, then uh, m, the number of modes, is um, scales with the cube of the number of photons. So you need many, many more modes uh, than photons, which is great because modes are cheap and photons are expensive, right? And so this is actually, um, well, it's going to be challenging to implement this uh, with current technology, but it's not impossible. Right? And then um, uh, if we also take into account uh, uh, photon loss, then, uh, then we have a certain transmittivity, uh, transmissivity, um, uh, that goes from zero to one. So one is all the photons are getting through. And so then uh, in this plot, uh, we look at how many bits uh, can we send per mode. So this is basically, this is a different way of, uh, of measuring, uh, it's like, it's because it's a complex problem and you need multiple perspectives on it. And so this is a different perspective of um, how, how well uh, we do. So modes are cheap, right? But um, we can now uh, look at bits per mode. And um, 
And so as, um, uh, as we go to higher and higher uh, numbers of modes, you see that we can achieve um, a higher and higher uh, number of bits per mode. Right, so you want to use, you know, like a lot of modes, and uh, then of course you've got to also use. Um, uh, uh, you have to choose the number of photons that you want. So that actually is something that we've optimized over here. So for um, low transmissivity, uh, you can use more photons uh, because some of them will get lost and um, they they will not get in each other's way so much. Whereas if you use, uh, if you have a higher transmissivity, then you uh, can get away with fewer photons. So obviously higher transmissivity is better and everything in this plot uh, tells you that it is. So that's another um, an, another reason to um, you know work on how to reduce losses in an, in an optical communication system. Uh, right, so um, now what are the assumptions? Maybe I should have started with this but I didn't. Well, Eve can store the state for only a limited time, uh, the so-called bounded storage model. So this is something that is core to uh, to the uh, quantum uh, uh, quantum data logging. Uh, and we also work in the no collision limit where photon bunching is uh, unlikely. Um, and then, like already said, this experimental realizations are challenging, but we think it's feasible with current state of the art technology. Right, and then for my last story, um, it's um, I um, as I already mentioned, I met my wife at JPL. Um, she worked in the library. So John said, I, um, uh, when John uh, tells this story, uh, he used to say that I checked out a librarian, and um, and so we moved back to the UK. And the easiest way to do that, of course, is to uh, to actually get married. So. Um, so we did get married. We went to the UK to look for a place to live and, uh, uh, and, and everything. So I went to Bristol, worked with Tim Spiller and Bill Monroe. And, uh, and then we went back to, uh, to, to uh, uh, Los Angeles to uh, pack up our stuff and, uh, uh, and everything. And of course, um, uh, um, at the border, uh, they stopped me and they said, well, you're, you're, uh, you're married, then you need a different visa. And they didn't let me in. So uh, we were freaking out, and uh, and I had to sort of find a, a plane ticket. Uh, in uh, this was in Canada, the crossing uh, uh, in Toronto. So I had to go into Toronto and find a, um, a, a, a cheap ticket to go back to the to the UK. And uh, and then I had to. Uh, it was a whole. Uh, I'm already over time, so I'm cutting this story short. But um, it was a lot of a lot of hassle and. Um, and then, I, so I told John, uh, actually Rose, my wife, told John, and, and John said, not to worry, I'm going to write a letter. So he wrote a letter on, uh, it, had the, it had everything. It had um, Dr. Jonathan P. Dowling, principal scientist at uh, NASA, uh, Caltech, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, so he basically put the whole thing up and said, Do uh, Dr. Koch has a security clearance, um, and, uh, and he has to return government property and so when i showed this letter to the uh, the guy in the embassy in amsterdam uh, because i had to go to amsterdam um at first uh, before he saw the letter he was like no uh, i need the kick out report and that's literally what he called it the kick out report and um and i said well uh, they they gave that to my wife and uh, so i don't have it well i can't do anything without the kick out report and then i pulled out john's letter and i said well maybe uh, so uh, this is what my uh, my boss wrote and so he reads it and then he goes like okay i can give you a 10 year visa and that was uh, how john got me back into the uh, country and so we um uh, we uh, we packed up our stuff moved to britain and we lived happily ever after and so uh, thank you everybody for, uh, for, for listening uh, to my stories from John. Um, and uh, I, if, you do, uh, if you did know John, I'm sure you will remember him as fondly as, as I did, uh, as I do. And, um, and yes, yeah, so thank you very much.